As we're sitting here, uh, we can just sense into the body. It's just um, helpful to sense into the physicality of the body just as a way to um, give the mind something to do <laughs> other, than, other than think about itself. So we can just sense into um, the body sitting in the chair. Um, just feel, feel how that feels. Um, we can just notice if there's any spots in the body that are being held in tension in any way. Um, just sort of feel into those, see if they can be just relaxed gently without forcing anything. And if they can, wonderful. If they can't, that's just fine too. We're just, um, just sensing the body directly. And it's also helpful just to take a few deep breaths, just to fully aerate the body and uh, have that sensation of drawing in air into our lungs, into our body. Welcoming that nourishment. It's the sense of it filling our bodies and letting it go, not just biologically, but filling our entire body. So as we're just sitting here, not too much is happening in the room, I suspect. Um, we can just, in the spirit of what we talked about last week, the sense of I am, we can just um, relinquish any identities that we may be carrying with us in this moment. So. Um, any sense of identification as um, maybe with our career, maybe with our relationship status, maybe any sense of position, maybe identifying any sense of problems that we've carried forward into the day, just to gently set it aside, just for, we don't have to do it forever, we can come back to it, but just for a few minutes here, we'll just uh, sort of set that aside. And we can even take a broader view back on our life and any sort of lifelong regrets or unmet dreams. We could just, just set those aside for the moment. We don't need to carry them into this moment. In other words, we don't need to remember them back into existence in this moment. So we're just seeing if we can take some of the ways that we identify ourselves and just sort of gently set them aside just for a few minutes here. We can pick them up again later if we choose to. So we can also set aside, let's say for example, any ideas that we're carrying about how the world should be. or any ideas about how I should be. We'd also set aside any 
fears that we're carrying into this moment about the future. We can acknowledge that fear may have its place to inform us, but in this moment, we're just sitting in a chair in a fairly quiet room. And for a few moments, we can just set that aside. We can also set aside any beliefs any opinions about who should or shouldn't be doing something, just set those aside too. We can set aside any ideas about hoping things will be different than they are. Again, we're just talking about this particular moment. You might just sense into anything else that you feel is intruding into this moment and see if that too can be just gently set aside. We're not trying to make it go away forever. We're not trying to love it into submission. We're just sort of gently setting it aside, not forever, just for a few moments. And then we can just ask ourselves, by having set some of the ways that we define ourselves aside, is there more of a sense of lightness? Is there more of a sense of spaciousness? Like there's a little more room Does it feel like there's more of a sense of freedom, expansiveness? So we haven't attained anything that wasn't already present. All we've done is set aside some of the ways that we commonly define ourselves and just set them aside for a moment and notice that whatever we are remains. Whoever we are fundamentally is still here. We haven't vanished because we gave up our most cherished opinion about ourselves or about the world. So we can just notice that even in the absence of how we commonly define ourselves, there's still a sense of being. We haven't changed anything. We haven't tried to um, sort of take something um, of ourselves and bury it permanently. No, just for a moment, just to, as an experiment almost, to see what remains when we choose not to define ourselves in memory, the past, ideas that we have about ourselves, ideas that we have about the world, hopes, concepts, opinions, judgments, particular sticky one, So we can just notice in the absence of all of that, we remain.
This is uh, useful information, right? So whatever sense of spaciousness or sensing into some deeper essence of ourselves that we have may have experienced in the last few minutes, if we could just um, listen, listen from that space. In other words, what we're gonna talk about tonight isn't a conveyance of knowledge, it's not Hopefully you, you'll know less after the talk tonight than before. So it's not an acquisition of concepts or ideas or beliefs. Um, actually, to the contrary, it's really investigating um, how those uh, beliefs and opinions actually limit uh, our sense of self. So yesterday when I sent out the announcement for this talk, um, I said that we'd begin the inquiry with uh, a question of what, what is mine? And um, I brought up the example of, you know, the two-year-olds, the terrible twos, when they first discover, a uh, small child first discovering that they are actually they developed a, a recognition that they are somehow separate from other people. And this concept that you can hear expressed with lots of emotion, lots of energy is mine, this toy, mine, I want this. You know, I, it's important, it um, essential in, in the, that moment to, acquire an object, you know, or a friendship or attention, right? So it's this acquisition and suddenly there's a recognition that, that there's somehow a deficiency here that has to be filled and what will fill it will be the next object, the next desire, right? The next source of pleasure that I want to consume that. I want to bring that into um, my sense of who I am. And um, if I lose that, then there's this, you know, very real possibility of a tantrum. If I can't have that object to complete me, to make happiness be experienced here, then, um, then it's like my whole life, my whole being is uh, brought into question, right? Tantrums. <laughs> so we've gotten much more sophisticated as adults, but I'd suggest that in some ways the same mechanism still operates, that um, we still can be, uh, feel a sense of our existence becomes threatened if someone questions um, our concept, our belief, our opinion about something. You know, so it, it's like that sense of self has become so identified with who we believe ourselves to be that we'll, it'll be an adult tantrum, but it'll still have that, that same energy behind it, like, um, you know, how could they say that about me? I know I'm right, right? That sense of a personal, somehow that, that opinion, you know, may have started out as an idea that I heard from somebody else, but somehow I've absorbed it into who I am, right? I used the example when I sent out the email yesterday of the, you know, an amoeba, you've seen these old biology um, films of an amoeba incorporating, you know, food into their bodies where they just sort of move around it and then bring the particle of food into the single cell organism and then it's part of that organism. 
So in some ways, I mean, we've done that with opinions and ideas and concepts about the world and about ourselves um, throughout our whole life. But the really powerful ones are often the ones that we picked up in childhood. Um, where our parents or our guardians, our parent um, had sort of the first shot at our conditioning. So those ideas or our reaction to those ideas, those examples or our reactions to those um, become, um, we've incorporated them into our sense of existence, amoeba-like, you know, like suddenly it's not an outside opinion anymore. I've sort of brought it into the sense of who I am to the extent that, no, that's really who I am. You know, I really um, know that I am a person that's, um, you know, on the positive side, we could say do respect or um, uh, handsome or intelligent or athletic or whatever. And then on the negative side, you know, unworthy, unlovable, um, uh, victim, you know, whatever, whatever our story is, but they become so deeply incorporated into our psyche that it feels like, no, that's really who I am. Right. We've lost all perspective on uh, the fact that it was a concept that originated outside of ourself and we took it in as a, as a belief. Either someone told us that that was true, seemed like it was true, it made sense, um, and then there was an the emotional um, component to it that sort of anchored it in, the, in our bodies for a lifetime. So those kinds of um, mental grooves, you could say, have become so deeply ingrained that we just take them for being who we are. And then when we get into the spirituality, then we say, okay, look within, you know, examine, you know, who you really are and what we encounter um, right away is these old sticky condition. You know, so the question naturally arises, well, how do I undo that? How do I get beyond that? And, you know, how do I, you know, if I feel, you know, unloved and unlovable, how, how, how do I feel lovable, right? That should be the solution. So we've, we've given reality to um, a conditioning that has probably been there for a lot of years and the source is sort of clouded in the distant past. So we, it's hard to track back exactly the source of it, but this, the present day sense of it is undeniable, right? The really sticky ones can feel like that. Um, so we feel like, well, to, to undo that, I need to go to the opposite. You know, if I feel unworthy, the, the, the thing to do is to do everything I can to, you know, have these successes and experiences to prove my worthiness, right? If not to my parents, to myself, to my friends. But can you see that we're, that is still, that is still the same game. You know, if we, if we feel unworthy and we think that the solution is then to feel worthy, you know, the first thing that we've done is given reality to the sense of unworthiness and then think that the antidote to that is to, you know, build up enough credits on this side of the ledger so that it will offset that. But, you know, our sense of that for nearly all of us is, you know, sometimes it looks more like this, more unworthy. Sometimes it looks more worthy. Sometimes it can flip back and forth really quickly. Um, sometimes we're so convinced that we're unworthy or extra worthy that we get locked into those positions and uh, just proceed blindly from there. 
So, but the, the question is really, does worthiness have anything to do with it? You know, who is the judge of this worthiness? Who is that that is the decision maker that decides that I am somehow deficient and the solution is to become more worthy? You know, where can we see that that also is another thought that we've imposed on top of the conditioning that we already had? So the conditioning might be, I feel unworthy. You know, we, we get a little maturity in the world and think, okay, the solution is to, um, you know, improve myself. And that'll undo this underlying sense. But the game is the same. The game is the same. It's just actually two sides of the same coin. You know, when we see that the identity is stuck in this sense of who I am. So it's the mind trying to look at itself, judging whether it meets some standard. It's just, it, I mean, the, the, the way out of that maze is just to see that that standard is something that we uh, took on as an idea a long time ago, you know, and have continued to apply it throughout our life. You know, so rather than saying, well, I'll just go to the opposite and maybe that'll cancel everything out or make me forget about, you know, my unlovability or unworthiness, you know, just see it as all mental constructs. See it, see it as a whole package. See it as something that we've absorbed amoeba-like into our psyche where we've taken an idea that developed maybe out of what someone told us or circumstances or you know some high school boyfriend girlfriend said about us and we've incorporated that we've absorbed that we've you know ingested that to the point that we think that's who i am you know and then we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to prove the opposite, trying to improve our way out of it, or, you know, settle into it with a sense of despair. Either way, we give it reality, right? Without, without our imparting reality to it, it would just die on the vine, right? It is our belief in its reality that keeps it alive. So the sense of mind, um, if we really look at it deeply, is looking at um, how this conditioning takes hold, right? Regardless of what the conditioning is. It can be positive conditioning, negative conditioning, sometimes some of both. But how, how that conditioning takes hold to the extent that we come to believe that that isn't just, um, well, it's not just conditioning, it's actually who I am, right? So it feels like not something that I've learned along the way or picked up or got dosed with as a small child, but it, it's something that is so ingrained in me. It's, it's sort of like a, a virus, right? It invades the body and then it changes the cells to benefit itself. So almost like a, um, you know, it, it can feel like a DNA change in the body. Well, heck, that's just who I am. You know, how can I change that? You know, I, I guess I'll just have to live with it for the duration. So um, Mr. Gurdada had something interesting to say about suffering. He said the, the perpetuation of suffering uh, is based on our indifference to our own suffering.
It's a powerful statement, right? Our indifference to our own suffering. It's like, yeah, you know, that sense of unworthiness or um, uh, uh, victimhood or uh, depression or despair, you know, it sort of is what it is, you know, I'll, I guess I'll just live with it, you know, make the best of it for the duration, right? The indifference to our own suffering. When there is actually a way through that. I mean, that's the message, right? That, that's the core message of spirituality. There is a way through and beyond um, this sense of suffering, the sense of being controlled by our own conditioning. But what it requires is not to, not to spiritualize it, not to sort of make an end run around um, you know, whatever is causing us to suffer and, and transcend our way past that. Um, it's really, I mean, that, has, that can feel good for a while, but it's actually not um, anywhere near as free as we can be. The freedom is really the willingness to, to see through our suffering, the willingness to look at it directly, not from a psychoanalytical point of view, but just to see the nature of it, see the nature of how that um, conditioning was um, ingested, how all conditioning is ingested um, and given reality by our belief in its dominance, in its power, right? In its ability to sort of take, take over our bodies in this, you know, almost a cellular kind of way um, where we, we're not in control anymore. You know, it's just my conditioning. But that conditioning is based on thought. It is based on belief, belief about who I am, belief about the world. So that's, that's the nature of the investigation, to really look at um, those thoughts, those beliefs that lock the conditioning in place. You know, what, what am I believing that gives reality to um, this condition, the reality to the way that I experience suffering in my life? You know, but the, you know, we, the, the really deeply held beliefs, the, the conditioning that we're, we don't even recognize as conditioning. We just think, well, that's who I am. That kind of condition when um, someone challenges that or it feels like life circumstances um, is uh, tugging at that belief. Um, we can get really defensive about it and um, insist that, no, I, I really need this concept about the world. I really am this way. I really know how the world should be. I am certain. All, all of that sense. Um, we can just sense into the feeling of that. It's, is, I mean, is it really all that different than the two-year-old? You know, saying, no, this is mine. I need this. I need this for my own happiness. So it's that energetic um, um, imprint that we've given to these feelings, these beliefs, these ideas that lock them in place because we think they're mine, right? I'm right, I know, I know how the world should be. I know how the other person should be. I know how I should be, right? I'm certain just that clutching is what locks that conditioning in place. 
So if we're able to just step back, just a half a step back and see that, yes, that may be operating, but rather than put all our energy into trying to change it, fix it, make it better, improve it, if we could just step back and see, yes, that's happening. That's how this body mind was conditioned. Okay. Um, but there's something that notices that. What notices that is already free from that. The awareness that notices my conditioning isn't conditioned. You could say the, the, the higher can know the lower, the awareness can low, know the conditioning, the conditioning can never know the awareness. Right? It's prior, prior to the conditioning, it is already complete. So that, that awareness um, that is present for whatever conditioning arises, whatever patterning is there, whatever programming has been sort of uploaded into this body, um, we can see, yes, rather than put all our energy into trying to make that different, arguing with it, justifying it, defending it, that whole game is within the same paradigm. It's really a suggestion to step out of that paradigm and look, look back at it almost, you know, where we can say, yes, that's how this body mind was conditioned, but from the perspective of awareness, I can see that. It was, that conditioning was um, ingested in innocence. We didn't willfully take on those beliefs. We may have thought we were, we may have, um, you know, heard some idea or opinion and say, oh, I like that one. I, I think I'll take that one in and that'll be part of my repertoire. Right? But why did you do that? That was based on some prior conditioning. You know, the family that you grew up in, the economic status, the um, culture, the religion, the city, the country. all caused you to have a certain inclination for ideas that may have been adopted later on. So we can just see the accidental nature of that. If we trace it back far enough, you know, we can believe that, no, I consciously took on this belief system that I have, but when we really examine it, we can just trace it all the way back and um, it just sort of disappears into the, distant past, but we can step back, step out of it almost, and look at that nature of um, thoughts and beliefs that hold that whole structure together. And just see that that, that awareness is already free from that. So that was the exercise that we did at the beginning when we just, you know, set aside this little lump of conditioning and that and beliefs and fears and opinions and regrets and shames and blames. And you, know, you set all those things aside and see what's left. You know, we're reluctant to do that because we think, well, no, wait a minute, there's, there's some good ideas in there. There's some good opinions and beliefs about myself and the world. I don't want to let those go. Can you feel that sort of resistance? Like, you know, I'll, I'll sort through it and I'll keep the good ones and, you know, try to throw out the bad ones. You know, it's like um, going to the... Um, food store, you know, and you, you take your bag and you walk around and 
you think, okay, well, this is, I'll add this to the bag, but not that, and making these decisions. And those are all based on, you know, whether that'll give me pleasure, right? Whether that'll be good for me. So we, we have the same sort of um, sense of acquisition. And once we've, once we've taken something in, that sense of mine, no, this, this belief is mine. You know, I, it defines who I am. When I hold on to this belief, I know who I am. If I let go of it, I don't know who I am anymore. Right? Which is true. Right? So we've lost, by, by sort of stepping back away from that whole structure of how we define ourselves, we begin to lose a sense of personal identity, right? We begin to lose that sense of, no, this is mine, you know? The two-year-old before at age one didn't have that same attitude. Presence, consciousness, awareness, taking it all in, but not that sense of separate identity that, um, felt the need to um, grab, you know, I want this, you know, I want something to make me happy. I want something to make me feel good. I want something to make me comfortable and I have to have it, right? So if we can step back enough to just see that whole mechanism is essentially still at play, more sophisticated, sure, but essentially still at play. You know, I want my wealth, I want my health, I want my comfort, I want my pleasure. And all of those things are fine, but they are not who we are. They may be our experience, sure. Everyone likes pleasure more than pain. That's why we have words like pleasure and pain. <laughs> so, but um, if we step if we step back, we can recognize that they are both arisings within awareness, both pleasure and difficult situations are arising in time and space, you could say, for a certain duration. All experiences come and go. All experiences come and go. There's, there's a belief in spirituality that there, there will be a, a special experience called enlightenment that is different, that it will be so powerful and bliss inducing that there will be um, uh, bliss forever after. So that's not true. Um, it is that and there may be an experience that is uh, we could say coincident with awakening. That experience may be blissful, it may be mind-blowingly blissful. Um, that sense of overwhelming bliss may last for a while, but it too will pass. It too will settle down into um, what feels like normal reality. It feels amazingly blissful when, it, when we first encounter it because it's like a load being taken off our shoulders that we didn't know was ca we were carrying. You know? So it's a relief. That relief can feel like bliss. Um, that that uh, bliss after a while does settle down into... Um, 
has been described as a na the natural state, uh, a state of peace, state of contentedness. That doesn't sound quite as exciting, <laughs> but it, 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 it actually, where it goes. And that, that peace is from that space of awareness, which allows, um, which doesn't actually have a problem with the conditioning at all. It sees it for what it is, it sees it, yes, this body mind was conditioned as it was conditioned, okay? You can look around and see everybody has been conditioned, you know, some functional, some less so. Almost all of us, it's a mixed bag, right? But the important point isn't whether the conditioning is, you know, a little more functional, a little less functional. Um, it's really to see that who we are is beyond that. Sometimes you know, a, a, a quite dysfunctional conditioning can lead us through suffering so intense that it awakens us to what we really are. And that was Eckhart Tolle's past, right? Suicidal depression. Not, not a necessary way to go, but um, it, 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 can, it can also bring some people there. It's not necessary. There, there are easier ways to go than that. An easier way is just to see the nature of it, right? The nature of what was taken into these body minds is not who we are. I know it feels like it is when it's when it's being um, uh, carved off of our psyche, it can feel like uh, like a huge loss. But that 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 belief in our conditioning, in our belief structure, is what holds. Um, that whole tight fitting identity in place. You know, that, that identity doesn't improve its way to awakening. What we wake up from is that identity. We wake up to realize that we never were that person that we thought we were. The personality may remain, the conditioning may remain, but our recognition of who we are isn't that it is something prior to that, something already free, something already complete, something already at peace. You know, our, our mental structure may not be at peace. But when we recognize that who we actually are is already at peace doesn't need improvement it needs recognition it is already complete from that perspective of peace completeness wholeness we can look back at the conditioning that may still be present. And there's sort of a, almost like a kind-hearted grandmother to a small child. I mean, it's, you know, we see it for what it is. It's not condemned. Um, you know, we don't blame anybody for its imposition on ourselves. I would just say that's what happened. Okay, it's what happened, but it's not who we are. That's the freedom. So even after awakening, there, it doesn't, awakening doesn't cure all of those um, dysfunctional habits, conditionings. 
You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, if you went to clean up a room, but the room was dark, you, you could maybe clean up a few things. But then you turn the lights on and you see all, all the other things that you didn't see in the dark. So it's sort of like that. You'd, we do the best we can to sort of clean up our act a little bit. Um, then awakening may reveal itself. And then from that, uh, you could say clarity. Looking back at our conditioning, we can see, oh, okay, there's, there's some more things to look at there. That's fine. So that's, that's why I say it's not a one-time event. It is something that is a transitional event. Things may look different afterwards. Um, life goes on and there is always something more to see. So the, the awakeness is already present in all of us already, unavoidably. You know, we spend a lot of time seeking that when in fact it's more helpful to seek what we are not. That's what we can do. We can see that. Seeking the awakened state is bound to be um, like a dog chasing its tail because what we're seeking is what we already are. Right? That's the um, you know, um, amusing part of it. We find out that what we were seeking is what we've always been, couldn't be anything other than that. And yet, um, it's put us through this intensity, this search, this journey, this frustration, hours sitting, meditating in search of who we are already. <laughs> so we can, the, the, the direct way there is to see not this fault or that, but just see the whole mechanism that holds that in place. The belief that who I am is this package of beliefs, conditions, opinions, mental constructs. And then in the meantime, what notices that is already beyond that. What notices that is already free. And that, that is the doorway.